Hey guys, before this video starts, I just want to announce that Solo Fam merch is back in stock for a limited time over at bonfire.com. So check out my link in the description if you want to get yourself some fresh fly threads like the ones I'm wearing now. Also, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Can't forget that part. What is going on my fellow mythology nerds? My name is John Solo and today we're talking about a goddess who may just be the strongest independent woman of all. I'm of course referring to Athena, the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom, handicraft, and warfare. She's briefly come up in a few past episodes of Mythology Explained, like when I broke down Hercules' 12 labors or talked about her more violent counterpart Ares, the male god of war, but we've never really gone that deep in our discussions about her. So today we're fixing that. Not only are we breaking down who Athena was and what she presided over, but we're also going to explore some of the craziest myths about her too. From her birth out of Zeus's forehead, to her helping some of Greece's most legendary heroes, to her transforming helpless mortals into hideous monsters. All of that and more is being unpacked today, and I don't want to put it off any longer than I have to. So, let's just jump into it. As always, be sure to make your sacrifice to the gods by hitting that like button, subscribe for more content like this in your sub box, and most importantly, enjoy. So we've already established that Athena is the goddess of wisdom, handicraft, and warfare. But some of you might be wondering how that's possible when there already is a Greek god of warfare, Ares. So let's start by breaking down why there's two of them and how they're different. It's no secret that in addition to being great warriors, the ancient Greeks were also great thinkers and that some of the most influential philosophers in history have come from there. Well, this fact also lends itself to our explanation. Because the Greeks valued mental as well as physical strength, it made their perspective on warfare rather nuanced. They could recognize the different sides of it. The strategic side that required planning, intelligence, and forethought, all skills they held in high regard, and the more chaotic, violent side that was all about brute force and bloodshed, which, understandably, they thought much less of. To create the distinction between these positive and negative aspects of warfare, they created two gods, Athena and Ares, with the former being thought much higher of in most of the country. While Ares was often perceived as a psychopathic warmonger who enjoyed killing just for the sake of it, Athena was said to only support fighting for a just cause and only only saw war as a means to end a conflict. In fact, she favored those who exemplified cunning and intelligence rather than brute strength. As a result, whenever the two found themselves in conflict, Athena came out the victor. Interestingly, she also has a male counterpart to her other realm of expertise, handicraft, and that's her half-brother Hephaestus, but we'll talk more about him when we get to the myths. As for Athena though, she's what one might call a boss because of her wisdom and skill in the realms of war and handicraft, she was held in very high regard by the majority of Greece and was even the patron goddess of several cities. What this means is they honored her above all the other Olympians, and in exchange, they hoped to be protected and provided for. In addition to praying and making sacrifices to her, they also held festivals in her honor, as well as constructed temples and monuments like the Parthenon. The type of festival depended on what aspect of Athena they were honoring, because like many gods, she was multidimensional and given different names based on what role she was being put into. For example, in Athens, there was a major five-day-long event called the Plinteria, meaning Feast of the Bath, where her priestesses would conduct a cleansing ritual on her statue by washing its clothes, body, and any of her sacred symbols like the owl or snake. This festival celebrated Athena Polias, which roughly translates to of the city. As you might expect, this version of her was thought to protect cities. However, when honoring her athletic talents during an Olympic-style festival, she was known as Athena Promachos, meaning she who fights in front, and during the festival for bronze workers, she was given the epithet Athena Ergain, meaning industrious. She actually has way more nicknames than just those two, but I'm not gonna bother trying to pronounce them all, so here they are if you wanna give it a shot. Anyway, that about does it for all the basics when it comes to Athena, so now I think it's time we dive into the stories about her. And trust me when I say there are some fucking crazy ones, so you're not gonna wanna miss this. Now it's only natural that we start this section at the beginning of Athena's life, which as I mentioned earlier, wasn't exactly traditional. So before Zeus married Hera, he had many other relationships, and one of those was with Metis, a Titaness who was regarded as wiser than all gods and men. Zeus was afraid that Metis would one day give birth to a powerful son that was capable of overthrowing him and taking his throne, similar to how he overthrew his own father Kronos and how Kronos overthrew Uranus. So he put a plan into action to prevent that from happening. Learning from his father's mistakes, Zeus 
didn't just swallow the powerful child after it was born and trap it in his stomach. Instead, he tricked Metis into letting him swallow her. I know, that sounds like a foolproof plan, but what he didn't realize is that Metis was already pregnant. Now we fast forward just a few wives later to just after Zeus and Hera say their I do's and the king of the gods starts complaining about a terrible headache. The pain continues to get worse and worse until Zeus finds it unbearable, and in desperation, he orders one of the other gods to hit him in the head with a Minoan axe, a migraine treatment I think we've all tried at least once. When the axe makes contact with Zeus's forehead, it splits open and out leaps Athena, fully grown, fully armored with her iconic helmet and spear, and screaming a battle cry so powerful that she even terrified the earth and sky. Just when you thought mythology couldn't get any weirder. But don't worry, there's more to come. The young Athena went on to be raised by Triton, a low-level sea god whom Ariel's father was named after. Triton had a daughter of his own, Pallas, and he raised both girls in a militaristic style. So, as you would expect, sometimes things got competitive between them. One day during sparring practice, things got a little carried away, and Pallas was about to strike Athena for real when Zeus intervened and distracted her, allowing Athena to deliver a killing blow. Now, to be clear, this was not Athena's intention, and she felt horrible about killing her best friend. So, to honor her, she attacked attached her name to her own and called herself Pallas Athena. This was another epithet the warrior goddess commonly went by and it means young woman, though it's believed this myth was actually invented by the Greeks as a way to explain that nickname after its meaning had been forgotten. I know, the timeline of mythology is stupid confusing, but we're gonna shed some light on why that is at the end of this section. Since we're back on the subject of names though, I wanna take the time to explain whether Athens was named after Athena or vice versa and how she became the patron goddess in the first place. Now according to myth, Athens used to go by a different name, Cecropia and it was named after its leader, Cecrops, a half man, half snake, who led the city into prosperity. Cecropia was revered by the gods for being the most beautiful city in Greece, and both Poseidon and Athena wanted dominion over it. Because the gods weren't very good at reaching compromises, and these two were no exception, Zeus declared that there'd be a contest to see who could provide a gift that would benefit the city more, and the winner would be its patron. For his gift, Poseidon stuck his trident into the ground and summoned a new body of salt water to be created, which gave the Athenians access to trade and travel. It was an an excellent gift to be sure, but Athena did him one better. She planted the very first olive tree, which on the surface might not sound like a lot, but the Cecropians were smart and knew that tree would provide them with wood, oil, and fruit. Which sidebar, I didn't even realize an olive was a fruit. Admittedly, I never really thought about it much, but it just never seemed like a fruit to me. I always considered it more of a decoration than anything else. Anyway, after Athena was declared the winner, she became the patron goddess of Cecropia. They officially changed their name to Athens, and the olive went on to become a symbol of economic prosperity. So even the olive got a happy ending. Now the story is a little misleading because in reality experts believe that Athena actually got her name from the city and not the other way around. That's because in ancient Greece the een sound is very rarely found in personal names in comparison to city names. But still, it's a good story, right? Moving on to another famous myth about the warrior goddess. Remember when I said she had a male counterpart, Hephaestus, that also presided over handicraft? Well here's how that came to be. According to legend, Zeus's wife Hera was very jealous over the fact that he he gave birth to Athena on his own, and she wanted to do the same thing. Only her attempt didn't turn out so well, and thus came Hephaestus, the slightly deformed blacksmith of the gods. If you've seen my episode about Aphrodite, then you already know a little about old Hef and how Aphrodite broke his heart by cheating on him with Ares. Well, after this happened, Hef caught sight of Athena and fell madly in love right on the spot. I know, it's a little pathetic, but what are the odds he was going to find a gorgeous female deity who was also into crafting weapons and armor? In his head, it was probably a match made in Olympus. I'll show myself out. Hef became so overwhelmed by his feelings that he had to have Athena right then and there, but she wasn't interested. Even still, the lame blacksmith couldn't help his excitement, and after coming onto Athena, he came onto Athena if you know what I mean. Naturally, the goddess was disgusted by this, and she wiped his baby juice off her leg and threw it on the ground. But because this is Greek mythology, the ground wasn't just the ground, it was Gaia, the earth deity, and Hephaestus' great grandma. After coming into contact with his seed, Gaia got pregnant and gave birth to Erictonius, another half-human, half-serpent, who went on to be raised by Athena and become a legendary ruler of Athens. Now there are many stories we could segue into from here because in addition to being highly respected by the ancient Greeks and probably as a result of it, 
Athena was a prominent figure in some of their most famous myths. Namely, she was an aid to their greatest heroes. She helped Odysseus on his journey back to Ithaca, assisted Heracles during his 12 labors, she helped Jason and the Argonauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece, and many, many more. And while she is performing great services for the mortals in these myths, Athena did have a dark side, and it's one that fans of the Medusa story are no doubt aware of. In that myth, Athena punishes Medusa for being raped by Poseidon within her temple when she mistook their coitus for being consensual. Athena was a virgin goddess and thought Medusa's actions desecrated her sacred walls. So instead of listening to the poor girl's explanation, she transformed her into a gorgon. And as sad as that story is, it's not the only time she did something like that. There once was a mortal woman named Arachne who claimed to be so good at weaving, her skills even surpassed Athena's. The warrior goddess heard about this boast, appeared suddenly in front of Arachne and said, are you sure about that? Arachne said, yep, and so they had a weaving contest. For Athena's entry, she wove a beautiful tapestry that illustrated the horrible fates of the mortals who insulted the gods. And for Arachne, she wove a tapestry portraying the unjust treatment of the mortals by the gods. Depending on what version of the myth you read, Athena gets so insulted by the tapestry, either because of what it portrays or because it's so much better than hers, that she repeatedly beat Arachne over the head. Then, when Arachne had enough, Athena assigned to her one of the worst fates I can imagine. She turned the girl into the first spider so she would be doomed to weave for eternity. That's right, we have Athena to thank for spiders. Guess who just moved down a few notches on my list of favorite gods? Now, if you're confused by Athena's behavior in these two myths, you're not alone. Many experts have pointed out that her actions in the Medusa and Arachne stories don't exactly line up with the wise, just, and fair goddess the ancient Greeks had so much respect for. However, there is a potential explanation. As mentioned earlier and numerous times throughout this series, there is a multitude of different versions for just about every myth in Greco-Roman mythology. The reason for that is that many of these myths were passed on orally for centuries before they were written down, and many Greek cities had different gods they held in higher esteem. So depending on what city and time period you source your information from, the stories play out differently. For example, the myths detailing Athena's wrath were written by the Roman poet Ovid, who, despite being one of the most important writers from that time period and one of our best resources for mythology, had a flair for the dramatic. The versions of these stories that we covered were all written by him, but sources from ancient Greece actually depict Athena in a positive light, horrific transformations and all. In one version of the Medusa myth, Athena catches Medusa willingly having sex with Poseidon in her temple, so her punishment is a little more justified. In yet another, Medusa is raped, but her transformation into a gorgon is portrayed as a gift because in that form, she's better able to defend herself. As for Arachne, there's a rendition where Zeus punishes her for her arrogance by having her ability to weave taken away from her. Heartbroken, she attempts to commit suicide by hanging herself, but Athena transforms her into a spider and the noose into her web. This way, she'd be able to weave once more, and as a lowly bug creature, she'd no longer appear on Zeus's radar. As you can see, context is key, and now you Athena fans don't have to worry about your favorite goddess actually being a scumbag, so... You're welcome. But yeah, that basically does it for the messed up origins of Athena. So it's at this point I want to give a shout out to the people who made this week's video possible, Squarespace. As we've learned throughout this series, there seems to be a god for just about everything. Farming, hunting, blacksmithing. But you know what there wasn't a god of? Coding. And you know why? Because none of the gods wanted to learn how. Instead, when they wanted to build a website, they went the easy route and used Squarespace. And who can blame them? Squarespace is an incredible all-in-one platform that allows anybody to build their online web presence or even run a business if they want. You never have to download, install, or patch anything ever. They give you all the tools you need to design a beautiful website right in your browser. Whether it's their massive library of award-winning templates, their customizable layouts, or the fact that every design automatically includes a mobile version as well. And it's not just Greek gods using Squarespace, I am too. In fact, if you go to MessedUpOrigins.com, you can see for yourself. I've got links to playlists, a resource section where you can buy some of the books I use for my research, and even a link to my merch store where you can pick up the solo fam gear that's back in stock for a limited time. That's that's right, me. John Solo, a guy whose only experience in website design comes from MySpace, built all that. And I only had to use their award-winning customer service one time. So if you're ready to make some moves and start crafting yourself a beautiful website, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your free trial and use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Wow, that was truly amazing. I honestly feel bad for the people who skipped it. Forget them though, because I know you didn't skip it and it's time for us to wrap this up anyway. Now I just wanna know your guys' thoughts on Athena. Do you think she's pretty noble as far as Greek gods are concerned? Is there anything that you don't like about her? Was there anything you expected to hear about in this video that I didn't mention? Let me know in the comments down below. Oh, and when you're through with that, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to have more mythological content in your sub box. As always, I've got to recommend you follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, not only because it's the best way to stay updated,
updated on Messed Up Origins news, but also because my sense of self-worth is completely dependent on how many followers I have. And of course, follow our channel mascot, Gunther, because he's adorable and wants nothing more but to make your day better. And to eat my underwear for some reason. I'll be seeing you guys next week with even more messed up content. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.